Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Elections 2010. The voters. Angry, fearful, disgusted, cynical. The U.S., an unsettled nation. The Ground Zero Mosque. Andrew Cuomo. Mike Bloomberg. A voter uprising in New York. Joining me in the second of a two-part conversation on national and state politics and the 2010 elections are, once again, my two favorite political wise guys, uh, wise men, Ed Rollins and Errol Lewis. Ed Rollins, in his 40-plus year career, has served as a university administrator and political science professor. We love that. A political advisor to presidents and presidential candidates, to governors and senators. He's the mastermind of the historic 1984 Reagan landslide. Errol Lewis is a columnist for the Daily News and a member of its editorial board, a CNN contributor, and host of the morning show on radio station WWRL. Both Ed and Errol are active members of the Chattering Classes. They are often quoted analysts and commentators and often guests here. Welcome back, Thank gentlemen. Good to see you. Thank you. Last week, we talked about Obama. We talked about sort of the national map. We touched a little about what might be happening in New York. We sort of ended with a question on the state of the national political dialogue and the role of the media. Errol, you were, you were talking about the the impact of the, the various cultural changes, technological changes. What are we talking about? Sure. Here? Well, look, there. I was talking about how many institutions that people need to rely on have betrayed them in many ways. The market has cheated them. The politicians have ignored them. Um, the courts have not dispensed justice. The schools aren't teaching. And the media have not informed them in the way that they need to be informed. I mean, we have a, a real serious problem, and it accounts for a lot of the decline in revenue numbers for many media organizations. Uh, information is a commodity. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on the web. You can get it for free. The, f the top five or ten headlines on any given day, everybody knows it, and you can get that information for free. Uh, wisdom, though, sort of uh, applying some kind mm -hmm. of context to it, helping people make use of that information instead of just throwing it around willy-nilly, that's where the future of the business is. And not enough people, I think, realize that. Not enough people are retooling their organization so that what they're dispensing is useful information, not just uh, here's what happened, but here's why it's important, here's what you can do with it, Here's how it connects to another piece of useful information for you. But that's what you two guys did with Lou Dobbs, and you're not on the show, and he's not there anymore. So, I mean, is it is it valued? Is this conversation, is this dialogue valued either by the news organizations well, in, or their consumers? In, in, in Dobbs' case, it was valued because there were half a million more people every night watch that hour than do today. Uh, he had a point of view. Other uh, people in the, in the CNN operation, which I'm still a consultant to, so... I'm, uh, and it's their, their prerogative to, to run the station the way they want to. But he had a point of view. And cable television is about a point of view. It, it's, you know, if you want your news, you go to Google and you do your five minutes to get your headlines or what have you. Uh, it, it, it's bland. Cable is not bland. Cable is 24 hours a day, and instant news becomes instant news because it's sensational. Okay. The perfect example is, is, the, is the, uh, the Gainesville minister, Reverend... Mm. Uh, Taylor, I believe, is his name. Uh, he had 50 people who attended his church. He gets up in the middle of the mosque debate that has nothing to do with Gainesville, Florida, and says, I'm going to build, I'm going to burn, and all my parishioners are going to burn the Koran. It becomes an international story. He is on the morning shows. He is this. He is now, the Secretary of Defense calls him, saying, we're putting our soldiers in jeopardy if you do this. We have the mightiest military in the world. We're in, we're in two wars today, and if we're worried about someone basically expressing, wrongly expressing their right to free speech by burning whatever, uh, th th then it's crazy. It, it was a story for four or five days. I Googled it last week, and there were 12,000 news articles with this guy. Uh, you know, yeah, who, in a single day. In right. a single day. And, 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 and there's, there's nobody, I can tell you this from having been in this business for, since I was a teenager, in one form or another, 
there are too few people who are willing to say on their own, right. I refuse to do this story. Right. You know, I mean, I, the day that this happened, I was on the air with my radio show, and I, I told her, this is 10 minutes after 6 in the morning on a weekday, and I said, listen, I could go downstairs right now and get a crowd of 50 people on the sidewalk on 7th Avenue in the dark. Oh, easy! <laughs> and, and we would all understand that, that that's not news, I mean, necessarily. And there are too many people who I think don't want to sort of step forward and say, we've got we've to do better for our audience. We've got to do better for the country. Yeah, but is the, is the audi does the audience want it? Is the audience better? Do they really want not to be you know, I, sensationalized? The, the, I compare it to a restaurant. Go you ahead. can serve people Twinkies, or you can serve them roast beef, or you can serve them steak. Just because they're going to eat the Twinkie doesn't mean it's good for them, doesn't mean it's fine dining, doesn't mean you should be selling the junk, you know? Well, like, let's, let's set out a good meal and see what happens. The, the difference, in, in, and once again, in my, my lifetime, uh, is the difference between a Ben Bradley as editor of the Washington Post and, and, and a Rosenthal, who was editor of the New York Times. These were the nation's two great papers. And before a reporter, whether it was Woodward and Bernstein or both friends of ours uh, or other reporters, you had to pass the Rosenthal or the Bradley test, which is who are your sources, what are they, go back. Corroborate. The problem today with the demise of the news media, who's going to cover Albany? Uh, it doesn't mean there's not going to be blogs and all the rest of it, but who basically is going to go spend the kind of time? The New York Times just did a fascinating story. I mean, the Washington Post did a fascinating story that they spent two years investigating the number of consultants out of the Defense Department. It was an extraordinary story in which we now have 880,000 people who have top secret clearance, which is more than the city of D.C. Uh, when I was in the White House, was the, there were probably 200 people in the entire town that had top secret clearance. Now you basically, if you have top secret clearance, there's headhunters who come out and say, Doug, leave your academic. Here's a $50,000 bonus. We'll pay you $400,000 a year because we with you, I can get a consulting contract and go do here. I'm, I'm, it, I'm, yes. It was a, it was a, it was a, yes. But the point is, it was a fabulous investigative story that they spent two years yeah. with their best reporter. Most news entities can't do that anymore. Right. And going to your question, great news organizations don't worry about their audience. They worry about making sure they feel an obligation to make sure mm. the story is told. Uh, whether Albany's corrupt or the, or, the, or the downtown mayor is not doing what he should be doing, those were sort of the obligations, whether re readers liked it or didn't like it, whether advertisers liked it or didn't like it, there was sort of an ethics that you basically did that. That's getting diminished by the lack of people. No, it's true. And, and, and where, where you see it, no, nowhere is it more clear than in the little comment section, comment section that they'll put after every story. Right. It could be a, a kid was run over by a bicycle. It could be um, an epic corruption. And there's this sense, this assumption, it's a kind of a fake populism that says everybody's opinion counts. You know, even people who have absolutely no insider information will make sure that their comment is included. And that's a way to try to catch up with the immediacy of the, of the digital world. It's a way to try to hold audience. I don't fault the business strategists who are trying to make various news organizations work financially, but... We also have to step back and say, this is having some effects on our, on our politics. This is having some effect on the whole wide world. And we've got to be more responsible. I mean, going back to the Koran burning story, I mean, 70 people have died in riots around the world. And that toll is going to probably go up over, an, over a, a, a crazy man who had 50 followers and one bad idea and an irresponsible press that, that blew it all out of proportion. And when we abuse the power or we misuse it or we're lazy about it, uh, we deserve to lose it. And, and in talking about New York State politics, or we, we were going to, I mean, the mosque issue became the signal issue for Rick Lazio and to a lesser extent called Paladino, which had nothing to do with the governing of New York State. I almost pointed to the bankruptcy of their campaigns that they they focused in on. It. The, what, truth, the, truth, the truth of the matter, and, and, and I, I made a comment on Face the Nation, which I was asked right off the bat whether. I said, this is one of the dumbest things I've seen a candidate of the president do. And the president stepped into this. Right. Not that the president didn't have a right to basically encourage religious freedom and what have you. That certainly was the important thing. But he moved the mosque from a battle between a former mayor and a present mayor that never would have got beyond, you wouldn't have written it on the third day, uh, to where it is now a national and an international story. Uh, and a place that is never going to be built uh, and probably should never be built, but it's not going to be built. And we all know that. But it's been a story for three or four weeks now, and it got elevated by the power of a president making a statement that went beyond 
the dinner table, the, the audience he was, and I always tell candidates, remember you're speaking beyond the room. And, right. and especially today with the video cams and all the rest of it, it's just, uh, uh, you have to be careful with words. Words matter today, and they, they're amplified way beyond what they may have been. You and I could be having a conversation somewhere in a restaurant, uh, as I was with my wife in Iowa. A reporter was across the room with earphones in a thing, and she was a blogger. She took down the conversation, my wife, who was calling me, what have you, it's out on the blog. Mike Huckabee, who was my candidate, won the Iowa caucus. Fox interview, the first one they're interviewing is me as the chairman. Mike Wall uh, Chris Wallace says, I want to talk to you about this lunch. Who was the blonde you were with today at lunch? It's on the blogs. I, <laughs> I said, he happens to be my wife. He said, is there any way you can prove that? Uh, and I said, well, first of all, I'm not going to prove it. I want to talk about Mike Huckabee. Well, I want to talk about this. Uh, and I said, great, you can talk about this to whoever you want. I'm going to go do another interview. Uh, <laughs> then the story of me and Mike or Chris Wallace having a big fight became a big, a big it's ridiculous oh, what we have today. Yeah. And it's not, it's not that there aren't good, legitimate journalists out there trying to do the job. It's just that you're restricted by, A, the inability to communicate effectively. Uh, you're competing every single day with, once again, the instant gratification. Plane crashes, we want, we want to see it now. We don't want to wait a day. We want to see it now. We want to, we want to see the, 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 the tragic elements of it. As, as is so often the case in, in institutions that are troubled or that aren't doing the right. job the way they're supposed to, there's no feedback loop. You know, there's nobody to hold uh, an individual producer or editor or reporter accountable and say, look, you really screwed this up. This was horrible. This didn't, this didn't advance the goals of the, of the station or the newspaper or the magazine or even the blog. And we don't, we don't have that. I mean, there's still this. And it, look, it's part of why I went into the profession. Go ahead. You, you put a, a reporter out on the street. He or she can kind of go out and have some fun and do whatever they want. And, and it attracts a certain kind of a personality who can, who can do that and who wants to do that. But there's a point where fun becomes frivolity, and there's a point where frivolity becomes damaging. When you have reached a point where uh, the reach is more than it's ever been before, when the topics are critical, when the audience really does need some, some information, not just factoids, not just uh, another headline or uh, another cleavage shot, you know, but they need, they need to put this stuff together and try and advance something. This is where some of what I think all of us have to do, you know, we've all taught, and you do teach, um, there are a lot of people who go into this profession. They don't have a lot of social science background. They haven't seen the world. They 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 kind of don't. They don't. They don't have the political history. They don't know the family names. You know. I mean, and and something like the Shirley Sherrod case comes up. Right. The name Sherrod didn't ring a bell with anybody, and that's what I found amazing. Like, if you know your civil rights history, <laughs> and nobody it, did. The name Sherrod and Georgia in the same sentence should trigger. Certain connections for you, those connections were so not blame made. blame us, the educators? Is that what you're doing? I, no, well, no, I'm just defining oh, no. a problem. Oh, okay. And the fact that nobody in that case knew, all the way up to the agriculture secretary, seemed to have uh, reacted, and certainly the news media knew nothing about it, um, a real problem. Let's make the transition from the dialogue and the, the, the nature of the media communication to the notion of the United States, I forgot who did the piece, as an unsettled nation that this is a period of turbulence, it seems to be division, the voices are getting louder and the lines seem to be sharper. You talked well, last show about the large number of independents and that sort of well, runs it's, it's contrary all, it's also, to it's that. It's also the uncertainty. My, my father was, a, my grandfather's electrician, my father was electrician, all my uncles were electricians. My father was bound to determine I wasn't gonna work in the shipyard. The guarantee for me to move forward was to go to college. Going to college guaranteed me some kind of different kind of employment. A kid today graduating from college, in most cases, is guaranteed a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt, uh, which may have been the cost of the apartment. When you have 20% of your population unemployed or underemployed, another 25% above that worried about losing your job, I mean, you're talking about 40, 45%. There's no guarantees anymore to the old lifestyle. And you counter that with the people see the Wall Street and the, the Goldman Sachs and all the rest of them doing whatever they do, uh, but all of a sudden they're getting millions and millions of dollars uh, for, uh, for doing it. Uh, you know, it's, it's bad enough to have to watch basketball players and football players, you know, getting $50 million for throwing a football, but the idea that some guy pushes paper around uh, and shuffles money and he makes these enormous sums where other people basically are sitting out there saying, my life, you know, I, my grandfather worked in General Motors. I wasn't going to work in, my father did. There's no General Motors to work in. The uncertainty in the country 
uh, is what I think is creating a great, great uh, dilemma today. And you combine that with the, the political system, that back and forth is always trying to get raucous. And the hyperpartisanship that we talked about sitting about her. People are sitting there saying, you know, get these clowns out of the way. They, they're not helping me, they're hindering me. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, and going to the point we were making earlier about the media, today as a political strategist, it used to be I'd try and get a newspaper interview, I'd try and get a role to write something good about my candidate or whatever. I could care about him today. He's totally relevant to me. If they got money, they have an ability to raise money, bam, I buy TV, I, I, blow, right, I blow right by them. Uh, mm. you know, and the epitome of it is just go to Connecticut, our neighbor state here. We have, we have Ms. McMahon who spent $30, $40 million uh, against a guy who had a very legitimate record and somehow thought he had to falsify his, his, mm -hmm. his, his you know. His military No service. one asked him, did you serve in Vietnam? Right. But he wanted to, you know, and has, and has tarnished his, I mean, why would you even exaggerate that? I mean, but that's the world we live in today. And the added thing to that is he probably had made those kinds of comments over and over again, but had never been caught. Now, right. now someone has a video cam. Someone had, not even video cam. They pull out their they pull out their uh, and it, their I mean, telephone. Look, it, right. it, and it, it adds to this free floating uh, anger and bewilderment that's out there, where people are wondering, how do we get to this point? How do we get back? How come all the jobs are going overseas? What's going on with this immigration problem? And they start looking for reasons or places, and, and this is then where sort of the shadow side of American politics starts to emerge, where you get things like this Koran and this mosque controversy, where people who obviously have no understanding of Islam, don't know anything about it, right. but they're, they're focused, and now they have a place where they can put some of this anxiety and maybe try and work it out. And the leaders who exploit that, and I'll say Rick Lazio's name, even though he's a family friend, uh, of, we got family out there in Long Island, um, it's the worst thing you can do as a political leader. It's the very worst thing you can do, is to take people's fear and bewilderment and try and exploit it for political gain. And I, I think that's what he did. Isn't that the done. nature of American politics and hasn't only been for, that only way from the, the beginning? Only for the last couple of centuries. Yeah, I would, I, well, I would but, say you know, so. It doesn't, doesn't make it right, though. It, does, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right. And, and I think the stakes are higher, frankly. You know, okay. I mean, I, I think we've, we've you know, we're, you, you, every bit that you add to apathy and cynicism and, and, and fear is, um, I think, magnified now that we are a, a very powerful uh, country that's the only superpower left. Over the last week or so, there have been a number of editorials and op-ed pages in, 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 the, in the New York papers about throwing the bums out. Vote out all your incumbent assemblymen, all your incumbent state senators, and you've got this organization led by Ed Koch, New York Uprising. Is there, is there going to be a New York uprising? Is there this sort of this grassroots throw the bums out, or is this another media... Uh, basically media f uh, fostered uh, I, I, I see it very differently being inside the business. I see it as, frankly, um, an excuse for laziness. You know, because uh, rather than going through 212 legislators and trying to figure out who did what and who's for real and who's not for real and who's worth saving and who should be thrown out, it's easier to say, ah, throw all the bums out. And that's... That, and that the, ain't gonna happen. The public can see right through it. And you did, They're a, not gonna and, and you did a column uh, within the last week about that top-down reform ain't gonna work anyway. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. I mean, I, I I know all about Albany dysfunction. I've seen it up close. I know a lot of personal stuff about a lot of these guys. I would I said in the column I would trade the next five books about Albany dysfunction and good government for one solidly well-organized political club that shows people how to canvas, how to talk to their neighbors. How to, how to raise money legally, how to put a guy in office or a gal in office and how to keep them there. That's what we need. That's what's going to rescue the state. It's not going to be some, some, some rules change or some, some trick that gets pulled in Albany. That's it's, it's not the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem is we don't have the right candidates. We don't have the right mechanisms for accountability. They know it. We know it. The press should know it. And um, somehow we keep trying to figure, uh, well, one more ethics change will, will stop people from trying to steal. Talk about something that's been going on for centuries. People have been trying to steal money since, oh, well, come on. <laughs> since I mean, the first uh, tax dollar was collected. Ed? The, the, Nevada has a very interesting, on their ballot, they have none of the above. Uh, Harry Reid's salvation, by I the way. I love it. In France, they have the, you know, <laughs> and, the Feast 12 vote. Come and, on. And uh, there's similar things in some other states. But if you had none of the above uh, on a ballot, and, wow. and people... I mean, I, I sit here today, and I'm, I'm, I'm registered in Westchester County. I have a house there. I've never missed a right, vote right, ever in my life. Thing, you know? right, exactly. But it's sort of like, 
I mean, who am I going to go? Where is there's no enthusiasm, there's no anything. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, that's the dilemma that a lot of Americans face today, where I think the, the whole idea, even with this election, where there's a lot of anger, a lot of people are going to vote by not, or a lot of people are going to show their anger by not participating. Right. Uh, that's their prerogative. At the end of the day, Earl's point is you don't have good choices. And I always say about the game, when people say to me, well, that person can't win. I said, it's like the game of poker. Your pair of twos may not look like not much, but if you got the guts to stay in the game, it beats one of a kind. Yep. You know, and, yep. and, yep. It's, it's, uh, and it's an unfortunate way it is, but I think to a certain extent, looking down the road, I think we have more chaos, not less chaos. I don't think this election is going to be a dramatic change election. It'll make it much closer between the two sides, but it's not going to basically do real bipartisanship. The two presidents who've done bipartisanship in the modern era were Reagan and Clinton. Both didn't deal with the fringe element. Right. They, they dealt with the leadership. And you sit down, and what this president has to understand is he's got to sit down with John Boehner. He's got to sit down with Mitch McConnell, and he's got to say, this is what I want. These are the ten things I want. What are the five things you want? Uh, and can we work this out? You can't go get the girls from Maine and say, you know, we've got our right. little number. And the one thing that will happen after this election is it's either bipartisanship or nothing. Mm. And that's the way it's going to be. On wow. Wow. We'll come back to that at the very end. Let's talk uh, some names here. Andrew Cuomo. I say Andrew Cuomo. You say? I say, first of all, disclosure. My wife works for Andrew Cuomo. Okay. Um, but uh, she, I think he's, he's got the right idea. He is trying to do something different. He's, uh, unlike Spitzer, not going to imagine that he can come in with a large electoral mandate and mow down everybody who gets in his path. He's not going to try and steamroll anybody. He's made a, a lot of outreach, a, a fair amount of outreach, some of it behind the scenes, to Republicans oh, and former Republicans. Absolutely. Uh, you know, his running mate, uh, Duffy, you know, former Republican. Right, and Mangano and, and Nassau, et cetera. So, so I, I think he's got the right idea. I think also because, look, he came of age in the 20s. He was there on the second floor in the Capitol watching his father uh, do battle with the, the, the legislature. He knows the, the nature of the system. He knows that it's got to change or the whole state's going to go under. And so um, he's, he's, he's going to throw some surprises at us. I don't know if it's going to get distorted by the fact that he probably wants to be president or whatever it is that every governor wants. But if he can stick to the mandate that he's going to have for at least one term, we can see some real positive change. Up there. And he's lucky in, in, in his choice of opponents. It's always good to have weak opponents. Uh, you know, talk about political redemption and comeback. I mean, this was a guy we've been having the show a few years ago after, after his aborted attempt to run for the gubernatorial primary. People would have said there'll never be a Cuomo elected anything again. Uh -huh. uh, he came back. He worked hard at it. Uh, uh, he basically uh, has been a very solid attorney general. Uh, I, I think that he's he's. And I I am a big fan of his dad, not as a not as a Republican, but as a as a political personality. And I used to always say, if I was a Democrat, I would, which I'm not, I would be a Cuomo Democrat because he had passion. And unfortunately for the country, his father didn't want to be president, or mm -hmm. at least wasn't didn't want enough to go to New Hampshire. Mm. Uh, this one has probably going to have the greatest difficulties of any modern governor in this state. Uh, if he can uh, make this state a better place, and that's the measurement you always have to use, at the end of a four-year term, is it a better place than it was? Uh, then you deserve great credit and you're entitled to move forward. Are you go, better off than you were four years it's ago? It's a very important question. And okay. We're, and we're going to ask that question about our mayor uh, in the very near future. If he would have left after two terms, as he was supposed to, uh, people would have looked at him as a great mayor. If he s suffers through this third term, as I think he is today, and will be only worse uh, for a variety of reasons, some mm. of his own making, or is anybody going to remember him as a great mayor? Uh, but, and then let's stick with Bloomberg. I mean, what's the story? I mean, he's, he's, he's running a national campaign He's yet. never abandoned his presidential ambition. I mean, is that like it? I mean, he's, 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 like he's in tell. Michigan, he's in Not Pennsylvania, he's minute. all over. What, what his advisors will tell you is that, well, he wants to stay relevant, so he wants to keep a little chatter going. It goes well beyond that. I've, I've watched him at the White House. Body language doesn't lie. The guy wants to work there, okay? Oh. And he doesn't want to work there as an intern. No. Okay? So, or even so, Treasury Secretary? Uh, no, no. He had that he, opportunity. He wants to live there. That's right. Yeah, but he'll probably have his own apartment anyway. Yeah. Well, the bottom line is that you, uh, 
in modern times, you only get elected as a Democrat or Republican. And if he ever figures out what he is, uh, I hope the Republicans have now realized he's not ours. Uh, and I don't think the Democrats are going to like him. Uh, so, you know, he, he can run as an independent. Uh, he certainly, with his resources, uh, uh, he's not as crazy as Ross Perot, whose campaign no, I managed. Nah. Uh, and, and I think to a certain extent, this may be a very interesting environment uh, because you may, you may have some unsatisfactory choices, including the incumbent president. One of the parties has to collapse in order for an independent to be a viable candidate, uh, meaning in that particular right, election. Right. Uh, and it doesn't look like either party is going to do that. I don't believe so. And you, I, could you imagine him paired up, say, with a, uh, a, a southwestern uh, Republican conservative? No. No, uh, I mean I just don't think he. Mm -hmm. what, what, and what is his, what is his appeal? What is the, you know he. he, uh, he, he People he, in America worship the rich. I think that's the appeal. <laughs> they, they, Sixteen billion dollars. People are very dollar impressed by billionaires. Okay. Uh, Self-made. Last, last question. We've got about a minute. Predictions, national level, Senate, Dem, Rep. I think the Democrats will hold on with a very narrow a two or three seat margin. Uh, I think Republicans are going to win the House. I think we're going to have Speaker Boehner with a, with a few. More than 39 seats. Big, I, big I, midterm election. I think a big midterm, but I don't, I don't, think, I don't think it's 60. I think, it, I think it could be 43, 44, 45. That's enough. It, well, it's enough, but then you're basically are into trench warfare. Yep. You, you, yep. Get, you get the committee chairs and you get the speakership office and all the rest of it, but it's, if you don't share power, which is not a bad thing right. when you have a split country, yep. then uh, you're going to have chaos. Governors? Uh, the all indications are that the Republicans are going to have two thirds of the governorships. If you control, if you control the state houses, you often control redistricting or influence it. Ob obviously, advantage Republicans. Uh, definitely advantage Republicans. Uh, you know, the demographic changes are not quite as dramatic as they traditionally have been mm -hmm. in the sense that California, where I grew up, always got more seats. It's not going to get a new yep. seat. Uh, uh, Nevada will get a new. You know, it, it's 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 a strange. I mean, the the. the the state that moves to a big place is uh, Florida. Florida is going to yep. be the third most yep. popular state. Uh, yep. And it's still going to be California and New York are going to be Democrats, and Texas and Florida are going to be Republicans. Uh, for, for, so you start your electoral math, and then you, uh, then you go from there. One last question, because uh, we're really over time. If you were going to watch one single election, what's the election that you're watching? Oh, boy. Um, that's an interesting question. I'm watching the, the, the governor's race in Florida. Okay. I'm watching the Senate race in California. I think Barbara Boxer's done. Ooh. Thank you, Ed. Thank, thank you. you, Errol. And thank you for joining us this week. Next week's guests are former New York State Senator Seymour Lackman and journalist Rob Polner, both talking about their just-published book on you, Carey, The Man Who Saved New York. Join us. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.